this um, story about a doctor I think is really interesting. So this doctor, um, he lives in New York, he's a doctor in New York, and he meets um, Isaac Perlman, who I frankly didn't know, but I guess he's like the world famous violinist. Um, and he's talking to Isaac Perlman, and he asks, he says, do violinists have coaches? And he says, well, I don't know, but I do. And he said, they, uh, he always had a coach, and his coach is his wife. And him and his wife went to Juilliard together, but then she gave up being a concert violinist to be his coach. And so whenever there was a concert, his wife would be in the audience, and she'd be critiquing him. And afterwards, she'd say, you know, like that middle part, that was a little mechanical. What could you do to make it better? And he said, um, he said, and I like this, uh, he said, without her, he wouldn't have been a better person or violinist. And he says, everybody needs a coach. Whatever you do, you need a coach. If you want to get better, you need a coach. He says, it's not good enough. I'm sorry, he said, it's not how good you are, but how good you're going to become. So this doctor starts thinking about this. And usually when we use the term coach, you always think of sports. But actually, um, coaching in sports is a very new phenomenon. It's a very American idea. The first coach in sports happened in 1875, and it was Yale that hired one for their football team, which is a new idea. And they played Harvard, and for decades, they would beat Harvard because they had a coach. And the idea was either you're talented or you're not. But a coach can make all the difference. And after years of losing to uh, Yale, Harvard finally hired a coach. And now, any professional athlete is always going to have a coach because to get kind of that um, better awareness of how you're doing, you need a coach. The truth is, coaching works. So this doctor's thinking about it, and he's a good doctor, but he decides, you know, like Isaac Perlman, I'm going to have to get a coach. So he hires one of his ex-professors to watch him in a surgery, to critique him. And he said the surgery went fantastic. He was absolutely sure afterwards. The guy would say, oh, there's nothing I can tell you. After the surgery, he had pages of th <laughs> things he could do to improve. And he was shocked. Like, he, like, I didn't know this, but if you're a surgeon, I guess you keep your elbows in. He says, no, sometimes you're letting your elbow uh, drift out and you ch need to change your foot position sometimes. And his rate of becoming a surgeon actually increased. He became much, much better. If you want to become better, if you want to go to the next level, you have to get a coach. It's not how good you are, it's how good you're going to become. And even this, this doctor, he uh, is actually part of uh, the World Health Organization. And in northern India, they have an incredibly high rate of infancy mortality. It's like one in 10 infants die. One out of 20 women die giving birth. And so they're trying to think what to do. And he, the doctor says, it's not about education. The nurses and doctors are educated. It's about coaching. So he gets him to write this grant that in, I think it's 140 hospitals, they send in a coach. And the coach watches what the nurses are doing and the doctors are doing. They're taking notes and they'll say afterwards, like, no, no, you as a nurse, you've got to speak up and say this to a doctor or mistakes will be made or the supply person. So they have to work as a team. Um, and they did it. They did it in 140 hospitals and then, then they compared... 140 that didn't have it. And the ones that invoke coaching, the mortality rate for women and children dropped by two-thirds. So coaching works. And so my only point is that I think about that because it reminds me a lot of, um, well, really, today's readings, but also of modern society. Now, this is going to be my little critique. You're not going to like it, but I don't care. Um, no, we should be a church and a society that believes in coaching. That if you want to get better, 
you have to have the humility to be critiqued and trained. And my feeling is that I worry we're losing that as a society because it sounds, I went and saw the last Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi, hated it, and so should you. Um, <laughs> for several reasons, plot holes, blah, blah, blah. But one of the main reasons is before to be a Jedi, you had to have a master and it take years of training um, to become a Jedi. In the new movie, it doesn't take years of training. In fact, the Jedi just doesn't need any training. Luke is a terrible teacher. He doesn't even complete the three lessons. And she becomes a great Jedi by being emotional. And my criticism of that is we used to be a society that believed in years of training and critiquing. And now you just have to be emotional. Would you go to a doctor if you said, listen, I didn't take any coaching or training. In a tough situation, I learned to be emotional in the operating room. I don't think you'd want him. You know, you'd, but even as a church, believe it or not, as a church, we've had thousands of years of this idea of taking a master and being humble enough. It's right in the, the readings. Eli, uh, Eli, uh, well, Samuel, the book of Samuel, Samuel's one of the greatest prophets. He's one of the greatest prophets, and Samuel is given two great gifts. His mother is very tenacious. She wants him to be the best. No offense, his father's kind of an idiot. Uh, but he has a great mother who's very aggressive at wanting him to be the best. And she gives him to Eli to train him. And Eli, and that's where the reading picks up, Samuel is sleeping, uh, sounds strange, in the tabernacle, uh, before the tabernacle. And even as a kid, he can hear God call to him. And he responds, here I am. Now, what's odd about that is that phrase, here I am, just to go down a rabbit hole, every little thing in scripture means something. And that phrase, here I am, it always comes up in scripture. Abraham is an old man turns his life towards God, first person, and says, here I am. Isaac, Isaac, when he's 33 years old, says to God, here I am. All the holy people in the Old Testament at one point of their life says, here I am. Like when I, whenever anybody says, here I am, it means they've stopped being selfish and they're willing to serve God and other people. But Usually that happens like as an old man or Isaac when he was 33. Sam, he's a little kid and he's already made the transition that he's not living for himself but for others in God. That's what here I am means, that you'll be of service. So he's already gifted, but he doesn't know how to reply back to God. That's what Eli teaches him. Eli is his coach that is going to make him a great prophet. Now, the sad part on that is Eli, um, here's the sad part. Eli was his priest, but he was not a good father. He had two sons, and with his own two sons, he was far, far too permissive. And his sons grow up, because they're never held accountable to anything. They become priests, but they're bullies, and they harass the people of God. I know it's strange, you normally think every priest is a saint. But these two were bullies. And God says to Eli, because you, I'm paraphrasing, because you never held them accountable, uh, I will punish you. Eli makes up for being too permissive as a parent by being a great coach to Samuel. Um, I know that I just meant that because really, I think parents and grandparents and this community, we are supposed to be the coach for the next generation. And if you want to be better, then you accept a coach. Even our church, not only back to Eli, but um, in the early church, you would take on a spiritual director. In Ireland, when it had its golden age of spirituality, the idea is that everybody needed a spiritual director, a coach. In Gaelic, it's called an Anamkara. We have that program here of people who can be a spiritual director. But the question is not how good you are, it's a how good you're, you are, how much better you can become. 
with humility, you need coaching. And yes, we should be the coach to the next generation. John the Baptist in the reading, think of him as a coach. John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, he points to Christ and says, there is the Lamb of God. And his disciples start to follow Christ. John the Baptist will say three times, um, I am not, not, I am not. They'll ask him if he's a Christ and say, I am not. I am is the word for God. He's not God. But Jesus is going to say seven times, I am. John the Baptist is wise enough to point people that their lives are redirected towards Christ. And Andrew is one of them. Andrew then gets his brother and points his brother in the direction of Christ. And the apostles pointed their generation towards Christ. And we come from 2,000 years that hopefully our people, our church, our parish, is redirecting people's life to point more to the Lamb of God. So I do hope our community, our mothers are as tenacious as Samuel's mother, that we direct the next generation to point like, uh, like Eli did, like John the Baptist, like Andrew and Peter did, towards something greater than themselves. We teach the next generation how to quit being so selfish and say, here I am. Um, take on a coach or become a coach. But that's actually our great tradition to becoming spiritually better people. And so together, let us stand and profess our faith.